So let us begin by looking at John 11, 21 through 27. I'm going to take my time, because not because I have very little, and I've got to stretch it over six weeks. Actually, I have so much. I've been meditating this for a year and a half. So I am so full. And so I'm really happy to get, lay this out so that you could pray, these, pray into these things and see if they be so. And if they be so, begin to receive it. The problem is that knowledge puffs up, creates a mind that we know something when we know nothing. But love edifies and love causes us to be known. So the perception that we want to touch isn't something that you want to probably get mind first. You want to get heart first. So I want to pray tonight that the Lord would open our hearts. See, it says that lest you see with your eyes, hear with your ears, and understand with your heart, and turn, turn to the, what you see, hear, and understand, and then comes the healing. So the, the turning is by what I see and what I hear, but that my heart grasps, takes hold of it. So, so let us pray. Father, would you, in this season and in this new t- time that we've entered into, give us eyes that can see and ears that can hear and hearts that understand. May we hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. And may we enter into the miracle that is now happening. We thank you, Father, for the grace and the glory that's coming in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, got a text. Um, the first advent was the miracle of the Father. The resurrection was the miracle of Jesus. And the maturity of the church will be the miracle of the, of the Holy Spirit. We are in the miracle of the maturity of the church by the Holy Spirit, but it will not be possible until we grasp fully the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus and what that fully, what fully transpired. So in John 11, Jesus says to Martha, Lord, if you, or Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. So they had a hope for Jesus coming to heal a sick brother, and now he could no longer heal a sick brother because they had a dead brother. But now, even now I know whatever you ask God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. The word again isn't in the the Greek, so you more simply would have said, your brother will rise now, this is pre-Jesus' resurrection. So he's speaking from eternity in the midst of a temporary moment. He's, he hasn't been raised from the dead yet. He hasn't died yet. But he is now speaking of, of resurrection. Martha says, I know he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. Now, we all are established with that fact. That's part of our basic doctrine, of the principles of Christ, the resurrection from the dead. And it is, it is, it's a double event in that sense. That it's a church resurrection. It's the, the, the great white throne of judgment resurrection. But this, isn't, this is what she's hearing or thinking, but this is what Jesus is talking about. She's putting it into an event in the future. He's trying to introduce her to a person who's come. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. So, to, in last, open our hearts to think new. Jesus is introducing a thought about himself that he hadn't yet experienced. So it's not an event when we talk solely about resurrection life. It's more correct, it's a person. We are talking about Jesus is the resurrection and life. And that's tonight what I want to do. I want to introduce us to this resurrected Christ and what, this, what we might begin to behold intentionally because if we can behold him in his resurrection, we will begin to be 
hastened into the miracle of our maturity like no other thing I've, I've discovered. To see who he has become is to know who I am becoming. So then he says, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Or Back up verse 25. I, I didn't finish that. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Trying to pull her into an experiential moment of agreement. And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of, the, of God who has come into the world. She's not really getting it, as we'll see in a moment, but she's, she's leaning as best she can. So I don't want to go any further than that because I want to take you to uh, John 1, first chapter, John chapter 1, verse 14. A lot of times... Our image of Jesus is based on the ones we've, of the Jesus we've beheld in the Gospels. And we've watched him born and placed in a manger. We've watched him grow up in his home in Nazareth, venture to the, to the temple in Jerusalem. We've even seen him uh, begin at the, at the Jordan in his water baptisms, and then he begins to move his itinerant ministry. We, we, we get an awareness of his headquarters in Capernaum. We see he's rejected at his home in Nazareth. We see him travel to Jerusalem on a number of occasions. We even know that he loved to go when he was in Jerusalem to stay two miles out of the city in the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in Bethany. We see him do miracles. We see him uh, multiply fish and food. We see the, 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 mer the resurrection of Lazarus. We see the, the, the pouring out of the oil upon his feet and on his head that, that is hastening and for his burial. And we see him in the resurrection we see him in the 40 days and his appearances with the disciples in the upper room on the way of Emmaus at the shore of Galilee. And we even see him as he carried, leads his disciples up to the Mount of Olives and uh, is talking to them, promising them the Holy Spirit. And then we see him ascend into the clouds and the men staring and looking. And he is, the angels say, why are you staring in the clouds the same way the Son of Man departed, he will return. Then we see the church start. And the church starts, and it would appear that we would now start multiplying this ministry of Jesus that we have just observed and, and watched these men. And yet they begin a, a message that's not about the virgin birth. It's about the resurrected Lord. They start a message almost like it's starting now after the resurrection. And I believe, we'll see in Scripture, that was exactly the intent of the Father. But tradition, and over time, we kind of went backwards in our knowing Jesus. So that we know at Christmas time he's a baby. We know by Easter he dies. And we have him on a cross or not a cross. We have a cross. And, and we, we are just uh, cognitive of, of this sacrifice he did, which is an important. Without this, nothing else goes forward. But we don't go forward into what came. So let me show you something that will start to challenge your thinking in who you're beholding, who you're to behold. And then if you get permission to behold the resurrected Lord, then you will intentionally do that. And a vista will open that's amazing. So in chapter uh, 1, verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth okay so this is the jesus from manger to cross this is the jesus that we beheld the glory of all of the miracles, all the movement, all the Holy Spirit, all the wonders. It was just enormous. As he lived under the first Adamic covenant that God had made with Adam, with, but without sin, but yet in, in faith and trust and so forth. It was an incredible, incredible. If we could reach that level of expression, we would be doing wonderful. But notice it says, we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. So this is, this is a one kind of Jesus. This is a one Jesus. This is, not the, this is not the Jesus we will now become a brother to. 
This is the Jesus that came for an express mission to become sin for us, to be delivered up because of our offenses, to uh, live out his life in surrender and submission to the Father, and then to be made a sin offering. So now let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 1. And some of this now is so worth... um, did we start at verse 27, 21? Let me, yeah, we'll just keep going because I'm, I'm going to run out of time. Hebrews chapter 1, the whole chapter. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he has made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself, love that, by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become, Jesus had become, so much better than the angels, as he by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So this whole gospel that we want to be proclaiming and and hearing is all about Jesus expressing to us who the Father is, and it is in, and it kind of starts with after he had cleansed us from our sins. For to whom the, which of the angels, to, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again I will say, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. This, this statement now that will be repeated in, Act, in Hebrews 5, in Acts 13, and, and subsequently enough to prove it to be a, a, a new positional understanding of Jesus, is now, now, now class, placing him as, today I've begotten you, you are my son. And we, let me show you, um, let me show you, let me... Uh, It comes out of Psalm 2. It's a prophecy, but let's go to Acts 13. I'd just like to show you something because the context of this is just huge. It gives, it will awaken, for me, it's awakened my whole life to go, okay, let's watch you do that. That sounds fun. Acts 13, and I, uh, verse 32. Acts 13, verse 32. We'll come back to Hebrews. Because we're, we're going back to the quote, you are my son, today I've begotten you. But it's not a complete quote. This is more of a complete quote we're coming to. And we declare to you glad tidings, the promise that was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. You are my son, today I have begotten you. So... This begetting is not the the only begotten. This is a begetting of the firstborn among many brethren. This is the model that we are now being uh, um, co-formed, conformed into his image, is the resurrected Lord. And you say, well, why is that important? Because if you understand it's about the resurrected Lord, then you'll want to understand more who the resurrected Lord is, what is he doing, how does he function, what does that mean for us, where's his role in our relationship, how do we identify with him in his resurrection. It changes the game, literally. So we're not repeating a a Jesus Galilee tour. We're beginning to live a heavenly in the presence of God place, which is what the place he went to prepare for us. Not the place he had been in, the place he went to prepare. So, and, and that he has been raised from the dead, no more to return to corruption he has spoken. Thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. So, uh, 
If you go on your way back to Hebrews, which I know we're not using Bibles anymore, we're using flips on the car, but let's stop at, yes, you've got a Bible. Yay, Chris. Go stop at Romans 8, just really quick, and let me just show you something that begins to, uh, I'm in Acts, Romans 8, this is why you're going to want to come and pray with me tomorrow, because this will break open when you pray it. Romans 8, uh, verse 28 through 30. Romans 8, 28 through 30. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, that's before time, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So the firstborn means there were many more to be born. And we are now being conformed to the image of the resurrected Christ. Can you start to see that? I mean, it may go like, well, what does that mean? It'll mean a lot in a little bit. Because it's the one you're looking to behold. It's the one, and moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these all justified, and also glorified. We'll look more into that next week. But let's just say that in before time began, And when God started creation and man was being formed, God saw all that would come and he saw all that would need to come. And so he saw that he would come as a sacrifice to undo all that was done, being done, and would ever be done as far as sin and separation. And he saw that in a moment of time there would be a begetting of a new man, a new creation to which we are now joined to. And this would be Jesus. God, man, man, God. Resurrected Lord. Uh, with an inheritance, with a name, with a, with a purpose. And it would be outlandish. It would be beyond anything creation ever held. You see, creation's glory is nothing compared to redemption's glory. But, but we want to get back. I, you know, I'd be happy sometimes just if I could get back to the, first, the beginning point of life. Where God says, why would you want to do that? If you can go through the death point, then you can come to a resurrected place in life. But that's going to follow the model of Jesus. So, now that you've seen that, go back to Hebrews 1. Let me point out, for your study, Hebrews 1 begins to show us the image, the express image of, of the Father in Christ. And this image in Christ is the resurrected Christ. And all the scriptures that I'll read are all out of Psalms, out of Deuteronomy, different places, but they all point to the resurrection, not to the uh, birth in the manger and the growing up in the, in, in the Galilee. So in Hebrews, uh, let's go on to back verse 3 again. Um, verse 5. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. He was the father to the son, but now he's the father to the son of many brothers. So we couldn't be the Jesus that walked Galilee, the first advent, but we now can be a brother to the Jesus who's been raised from the dead. And that's incredible it, because it's, there's so much more now that's come. But when he again brings the firstborn, notice, the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. When the angels break forth in worship in uh, Bethlehem, they don't worship Jesus. Not that he isn't worth, he could be worshipped because he was God. But they, they, they're, they, they, they're saying glory to God in the highest. This is the miracle of the Father. The Father has brought forth a seed that has become man. He's found a way to, to insert himself into fallen humanity sinlessly, perfectly. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill to men. This is all acclaiming. But when Jesus stands, he now stands in an entirely different place. We read it in 1 Peter 3 at the last verse. All the angels and powers, everything has been made subject to him. There's just like this new order. So that in the Revelations 5, we're now behold, beholding the Lamb and worshiping just as we're beholding him who sits on the throne. We're beholding something that has never been, is now fully there. And the angels, he said, 
he, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. This is all post-resurrection descriptions and, and glory that has been imputed to him. You have loved righteousness. You hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And lo, God in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. And they will perish, but you remain. And they will be, uh, and, and they, will, you will, they will grow old like a garment. All of creation is extinguishing. Like a cloak, you'll fold them up and then they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will never fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit here at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? There is just so much of a elevation that we're holding Jesus in, in these, in these promises that we are now associating with. And if you just allow me, go to chapter 2. Just the book, the book will uh, expand. That's what this whole book is almost about, to try to put Jesus now in the high priestly role of Melchizedek. Uh, but if you'll look just with me at verse 9. Our, um, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. See, we see the one now crowned with glory and honor. That he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, from whom are all things and by whom are all things, Father, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So the intent of heaven always was, Jesus will bring you through, you'll be a prototype of, of, pro, of passing, passing through earth, but you will initiate, dare I say, a new species, a new race, a new creation, never before beheld until the resurrection. When the Father said, today I have begotten, you are my son, that voice sent Holy Spirit in fullness of force to cause Jesus to stand up, a resurrected Christ. And from there, he stepped into an authority that was indisputable. Hell lost its whole operating system, shut down. Keys of Hades, keys of death, all handed over. All, of di all the principalities and powers disarmed, divested, shut down. All, it just he, it wrecked havoc. But he didn't stay there. He came up. But he didn't stay there. He went up further. And he didn't just stay up there and sit waiting like, you know, okay, guys, get it together. He stepped into an active role of high priestly ministry. That high priestly ministry is one of intercession. It is the most glorious thing to which he is doing, and he's doing it for us. Or the word for is he doing it over us, and we're in him. So if we're to really begin to have an experience of the image we're being conformed into, we've got to get to the place where he is standing before the Father as a high priest and begin to have an impact, have that impact our, our whole emotions, our soul, our imagination, our heart, till it starts to have an experience. So he, um, we'll, we'll, go, we'll do some more of that another day. But let me just show you one more verse. Verse chapter 5, Kim, and this will be uh, verse 5. So, also, Christ did not glorify himself to become a high priest. But it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. He also says in another place, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So, this emergence, this birth, this a resurrection, is Christ. The firstborn among many brethren who steps into the order of Melchizedek, which is all the book of Hebrews. And yet he walked through something that we're going to walk through. It says, who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his godly fear. But he wasn't, his prayer wasn't 
answered in that he was delivered from death. Because he learned to say, not my will, but your will be done. And we're all learning that because all our souls have to learn to surrender to the Father's better, to the Father, to the trust of the Father's outcome and not to the fear and the control that it wants to hold in the situation. Let it be. Not, you know, into your hands I commit my spirit. So though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. That's why it isn't just, oh, may I walk in the power of his resurrection, but I also want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. We know, learn more about Jesus in the fellowship of his sufferings than in the power of his resurrection. Because that, that begins to be the expansion of power where we really begin to come intimate with the one we walk with when we try to walk through stuff that we don't have language for. And we don't know how to handle it. And having been perfected, matured, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So he learned to hear by the things he walked through that were, and he underwent that were contrary to what his soul would have ever chosen. And so we are now being perfected in like manner as we learn to listen under or hear under who he is. So he's calling us to live this life as though the world that we're in isn't the world that we're trying to save. In other words, we're not trying to get delivered from the death that we're facing. We're trying to, we want to be heard. We want to be very honest. We want to walk through the process. But the outcome is really something far greater than the problem that we're in. The outcome is conformity into the image of Jesus Christ, the resurrected Lord. That's the goal of Papa. Every day he looks at me, looks at us, he says, I'm making you to look like my son. What son? The one who walked in Galilee? No, the resurrected son. The one who walks through walls. <laughs> the one who, who, who carries life. The one who is a living, life-giving spirit and not a living soul. One who's transferred uh, from the center of life being the soul but to the spirit. I want you, you're going to become just like my son. And yes, you're going to learn... He, he will be a faithful high priest because he went through everything you're going through. He was tempted like you in every way. He never sinned. So he can come to your aid in everything you're going through. He will never disengage himself from the journey because he is merciful and he, he will walk with us through the journey. But the, but, but the resource that we have it to, to lay hold of is what he's obtained for us that now he administers as the high priest. So we're not just trying to go through something for the sake of, well, he had to go have a tough time, we have to have a tough time too. But that's the contest of the fallen humanity and all that's going contrary to, to God's purposes. Instead, we're passing through that, but Jesus is up saying, come on guys, come up here. Get a picture of, of what I carry now. Let, let what I've done become yours. Maybe you don't have the ability to, at the moment, manifest it, or, or, but let's come into agreement with it. Let me begin to paint a new picture of who you are becoming. It's not just going to get through this thing and get out of it, and we're going to have another experience. We are a people that are learning to bring Jesus back, not a people that are trying to help Jesus complete his mission and go to the cross. He doesn't need us to, to prepare him for burial. We must prepare him for return. We must adorn him. We must hasten the day. It is an entirely different paradigm. But it isn't like, oh God, get, get us out of here because the whole world's falling apart and we're going to have a bad election. It's just none of that stuff. That's just like meaningless to heaven. It has no subs... It doesn't carry eternity. We are, we are people that are saying, we have a date and destiny that we will come forth, merge as a mature bride to meet our redeemed bridegroom king and we will so forever be together. But before we complete that joyous occasion, we're going to see all of the enemies of God placed under our feet so that there is, there is all authority has been now reasserted so that all things are under because Jesus, and we'll look at this next week in Corinthians 15, then Jesus will take all this resubmitted rebellion into submission and hand it all back to the Father. I mean, it's going to be, we're talking about 
concepts that I don't think I can even grasp. In other words, he's not even going to ever have to just kind of always rule with an iron hand and a, you know, a rod of iron over everything because it's going to get to a point where everything is going to be so completely resubmitted that he can just say, Father, now that now this relationship where you put all things under my authority, I return all this authority back to you. And the union just gets even tighter. The oneness becomes greater. So we're in this process. Let me show you... Keep going in Hebrews to chapter 9. And then I want to get us a picture we could begin to meditate on this week. Hebrews 9. I call this, and you've heard me share this before, I call this the three appearances of Jesus. And I make, it, I make that knowing that there really are two appearings of Christ. One that is a happen and one that's to happen. But there really are three appearances because there's the one that already happened and the one we're waiting to happen. Meanwhile, there's one that is happening. And that's the one we need to pay attention to. We need to connect to the present appearing of Jesus. And you just start to ask yourself, what is he doing? Is he pacing that? You know, you start to understand what he's doing is who we're becoming. And if we can become what he's doing, then he will, the next, the last phase of his return will happen. So let's read in verse, uh, chapter 9, 23. Kim, thank you. I'll bring them up to each one of them. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear. And there's the appearing that Christ is in current functionality in the presence of God for us. Let me, let me show you this real quick. Uh, this word appear here in verse 24 means to exhibit in person and disclose by words. So there is an appearance that is currently continually in the presence of God for us, on behalf of us, in the face of God. Literally, the word presence there would be the visage, the presence. So Jesus currently, in the high priestly ministry, is standing before Father for us. And the word for means over, as we are in him. Okay, so this is the one we want to learn about. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He would then have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's that first appearing. And that word is the word, it's a different word for appear. They, each one of them are different. And this word means to render apparent. In other words, it is apparent that he came at the end of the time to offer himself as a sacrifice for sin. His death at the cross, burial, resurrection, it is apparent. He has come and he's done this to put away sin. This is apparent. He hasn't doing it every year. We may celebrate Easter every year, but he only did it once. One time, once and for all, put away sin. This is apparent. This is what he accomplished, and it is accomplished. So he's not repeating his sacrifice. That's not what Father needs him to tell him every week. Remember the blood. Remember the blood. Remember the blood. Papa knows the blood. That's how come he can welcome us in any state of our being because of the blood. So he is doing something uniquely wonderful of intercession in his resurrected place. So as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time. This is the second coming of Christ. Apart from sin, for salvation. And the word apart, or word appear, which is a beautiful picture word, it is to gaze with wide, eyes wide open, as something remarkable. May I propose to you that the more we look up and behold the Christ in the presence of God, the more we will begin to be able to behold the Christ coming to earth. Because he's coming from heaven. He's coming in his glory. And when he comes, he's coming apart from sin. That means 
Uh, let me find that word. Uh, he will appear a second time apart. It's like the, the sin will not be the issue. It will not be what he's coming to resolve. It's not be the thing he's trying to, to point out. It's not going to be the thing he's that's stopping him. It's not going to be the thing that's quickening him. He's not going to wait for a sinless season and show up. And he's not going to pull back because there's so much sin. It is like that was done. Now I'm coming for one thing, and that is to complete salvation, to fulfill, the F, to fulfill what I fulfilled, to, to hasten it. So what, I'm, what that says can be almost like, okay, 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 but, but how, do you, how do you start to have a moment where this can go from head to and that's a lot of thoughts and big concepts, and I don't really know how to put them inside of the, the, the theology that I've learned. I'll show you how I started it. And I didn't, did it kind of on accident. Actually, for me, it was an accident, but heaven had it on purpose. Go to Revelation chapter 1. We'll close here tonight. I really encourage you, whether you come to pray with us tomorrow night, to take these scriptures and pray them. Because, there's, again, we're going cross grain to so much tradition that it will, it will, it will, it is, it's going to contradict or intersect images. And images are the things to which we, we respond to. And so when God wants to cause us to go into a new place, he has to change our images. He has to get us to repent. We have to think a different thought. We have to consider a different uh, scenario. So I'm introducing the idea that resurrection life is Christ, and in him is the experience that he wants us to enter into. And in entering into his present resurrection life, there will come a time where we will be together in the air and we will ride back on horses in a fullness of display. But he will appear in his church before he appears for his church. So there will be an awakening among young men, old men, who will begin to gaze and begin to see that there is something more evident to them than the one they read about in the Galilee, but the one that now stands in the presence of God. They will be, you will begin to become more cognitive of a throne of grace encounter than a hem of the garment on a, on a road. Those are beautiful moments. Those are breaking in, and they have the same context of faith but, we, but, the, but the, the context of where he is and who he is becomes to be that much easier to grab hold of. Because when we preach the resurrection of Jesus, we're not, we are preaching it's a done deal, it's been settled, deal's over, devil lost, Christ is Lord, victory is ours, doesn't matter how it looks, who cares how we are, what we presently feel like, we are being conformed into the glorious image of Jesus. And we can then easily, in any state, any situation, any moment we're in, just stand up on any day and say, Lord, I'm just going to worship you for the resurrection of Christ and that place to which I'm being conformed, that you will complete and finish and fulfill everything you've already done because it's already done. And I'm becoming who you are. And so give me eyes to see. So Revelation chapter 1, the whole chapter. If you want an introduction to the resurrected Jesus, this is the chapter in in beautiful imagery. I don't know how far we can go. Oh, gosh. Oh, it's just all so good. You know the book's called The Revelation of Jesus Christ? The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Not the Revelation of the Antichrist. You'd think it was a revelation of, the, you know, Babylon. It's, it's, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ coming into the planet or to be beheld. And so, because uh, I can't just jump right in the middle, let me do it, verse 4. Now, I'll just start in one. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of prophecy, and keep those things which are written, for time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you, peace, from him who is, and who was, and him who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Imagine sending grace and peace from the seven spirits. 
That even just speaks of a different relationship. Yeah, the seven spirits want you to know they're sending grace and peace too. It's going to get funny because I like to break our, our limitating thought. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, not going to be, presently is, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Just the posture, the positioning of who he is, who he is you could, when you pray, you, you pray into by praising him, by giving him the praise of this is who you are. You're, you, in praise, it always opens you to a more receptive perception than in study. Study is like, what does that mean? What does that mean? How can that be? I got to see, where's another reference? Worship is, Lord, I just want to bless you that he's made, you have done this, that you're the firstborn from the dead. And, and I just worship you that you've made us kings and priests to God, to your God and Father. And you just, you begin to behold by, by in the worship with the word. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Make no mistake. Even those, they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. The word mourn is, is a wimpy word in this, in the, it's, it's a violent word. It's a violent, when this, when this thing really finally just touches ground, it will like be explosive. It will be violent because, because the light will be so bright and so, so overwhelming and, and the contradictions and the, oh no. And, but not for all because there's many who he's inviting, come see me now. Come know who I am because I am coming as who I am. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I love the way Jesus will go in and out of present, past, and future. He doesn't have to go past, present, future. He can go present, past, and future. <laughs> I, John, both your brother and companion... In the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Which I wish it was just the kingdom. But on the two sides of bread, beside, inside is tribulation and patience. And it's not, it's all of Jesus Christ. Who, I was on the island called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. We'll, we'll, we'll learn, we'll elaborate what's, what are the, what's the unique difference between or what are the similarities and what is unique? Why repeat word of God and the testimony of Jesus? But not today. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. This is Jesus interrupting his prayer time. Do you understand? This is your Jesus interrupting your prayer time. Your limitation, your captivity, your prison cell, your place of stuck. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Myrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So this is this, here he is, the resurrected one coming. To one of his disciples, his apostles. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me. So you see, he heard, then he saw. He turned to see a voice. He turned to see a voice, like we would do, like we hear a familiar voice or something to catch our attention. He goes, who's talking? And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Go on. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. Now let's just, I'm just going to leave us with this idea. For the week, while we worship, worship by ascribing this picture of Jesus to Jesus, who you're worshiping. See this intentionally. Take the time to kind of go, okay, who is this one he turned to see? Well, when I turned to see, I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, girded from the chest with a golden band. 
I, I fully believe the, 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 the garment is fully white because we see it in the Mount of Transfiguration. But then he has a golden band, like a girdle, like, like it could be to your loins, but it speaks about his breasts. And so I, sometimes they put a sash, but I don't think so. I think he just has this glory band of gold. And his head and his hair were white like wool. So there's just this white light and white as snow and his eyes like a flame of fire. So as we behold him, this is who we're, he beheld. He turned around and, and look, I beheld him. Who? His feet were like fine brass and as refined in a furnace and his voice is a sound of many waters. There is so much authority. There is all authority in that voice. There's sound, there is reverberations, there is largeness. Oh, and he, can you imagine? He's, he's, he's looking, hearing, seeing. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, which we know is how he destroys all of the armies of the Antichrist. It's all that comes out of his mouth and his word. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. I got bushwhacked by the Lord a year or two ago in the, in the midst of this, the Lord said, uh, he just said, I want you to worship me here. Go ahead. This is who I am now. Get used to seeing me. And again, a lot of times, because we see one image of Jesus, we can't see the, the one that is now being given in Scripture. So we are trying to relate to a post-Christ when we ought to live, relate to the present Christ. This is the present Christ. Yes, he can cloak himself. He can come and show up in your house and you don't even know he's Jesus. He can send angels that you don't recognize. He can clothe himself. And, he, and every time we, we begins to show himself after resurrection, we don't recognize him. But when we do see in the word, this is this shining, glorious one, then there is a place we can worship at and we can begin to behold. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. <laughs> Behold, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Can, do, you, do you start to see this all-encompassing? I'm the first and the last. I am he who lives. I was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. So we got this thing covered on both sides. I was alive, I died, and I'm alive forevermore. So wherever you are in your journey, I'm there. Amen. And I have. The keys of Hades and death. Not collecting them. Not starting to be returned to me. One day I might have more authority than I have today. I have the keys of Hades and death. I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of times life is harder than I can face. But I can face Jesus and call him so victorious that he soon becomes the one who I face. And life begins to yield. Do you understand? I may not be able to tell the devil I have all the keys. Because he knows me too well and can undo me too quickly. But I have no problem telling Jesus, you have all the keys of Hades. You have the keys of Hades and death. I behold you and worship you, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the last, the first, the born. I behold you. I worship you. I behold you. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. You have the keys of Hades and death. You have the keys of Hades and death. And there's something that starts to Whatever, whoever you, you wor whatever you worship, you become. Whatever you worship, you become, because we were, we were made to worship, and worship is how we become. So whatever we worship, we become. And if we don't, if we worship this resurrected Lord, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ, then we open the, the uh, distinct possibility, since he is the firstborn among many brethren, that we all grow by imitation, by sight, by beholding, by seeing, that what we begin to see, we become. And this is where it, the possibilities start getting out, out of the box. Of people carrying uh, such a display. And, and how will we, we ever carry that display? Holy Spirit. Never us. But it's hearing his voice to describe who he is. Holy Spirit performing to demonstrate what he's done. And those two in concert rock the world and you're going to rock the world better than they did the first time 
in the return of Jesus Christ, it will be so magnificent that the earth will shake constantly at his returning. It will not be the Antichrist doing one last effort to, to gain ground and, and usurp authority. He will be losing ground at every, every turn just by the display of intentional movement. But I, the good news is we have a moment in time where we can begin to behold him. Now, I, I know you're looking at me like, like how they used to say, you know, like a dog at a new bowl. You're not sure if you can drink out of it or not. Uh, go to the scripture, pray, and open your understanding. Ask the Lord, Lord, are you, do you want me to worship you here? Is this the image you would have me behold? I mean, understand, none of these things take away the tender, kind, forgiving Jesus who let the sinful woman touch him, who moved with the response of faith. Because he still is that Jesus. But is it speaking to a Jesus who says, all authority has now been given unto me. You go. Go in my authority. Go in my completeness. Go in my victory. Go in my triumph. Now you have nothing that can charge you because my blood is your answer. You have nothing to fear because my word is your future. And you don't have to be afraid to die because your life is in my hand. Let's go. And, and the, the sound of that, sight, hearing, hearing, sight, hearts, turning, responding, something starts happening. All right. Thank you, guys. I'm going to pray for you. I'm sorry. It's really big, but... I don't want to talk about resurrection life as a force. May the force be with you. It's a person. And he happens to be my Lord and your Lord. And he happens to rule now as a high priest. And he happens to live in the presence of Papa who sits on the throne of grace. And he happens to say, come on up and join me because I want you to get comfortable here. This is where you will. This is the place we meet. <laughs> so Heavenly Father, I thank you. Oh, Papa. You know, these things are so huge that without the Holy Spirit coming and beginning to make f flesh, we would just think of it in an abstract term and it wouldn't touch us. But I believe you would open our eyes to see. May we, Lord, this week as we worship, be given a vision through your scripture, of this glorified Christ. May we see eyes of fire and a two-edged sword coming forth from your mouth. Sound of many waters of your voice. Whiteness of snow in your face, in your hair, garment, the golden sash across your breast, your feet, the brazen bronze burning in fire. May we see you standing in the seven lampstands. May we hear your sound of your self-proclamation, Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the firstborn. May we, may we these uh, this truth, this revelation, find um, touching points into our soul, our feeble, broken soul that's trying to, trying to yield and give place to you. May you show us how we might relate to you as our elder brother, how we might receive you as our resurrected Lord, how we might partner with you as our high priest a new role that we're just learning to which the writer said there's many things we want to talk to you about the high priest but you can't because you've become dull of hearing so Lord open our ears to hear again and our eyes to see and our hearts to respond and not by might and not by right and not by righteousness of our own diligence but by the gift the grace the coming the sound the voice the movement Holy Spirit reveal you are the miracle worker in making us conformed into this image. You, Holy Spirit, are turning all things to good and bringing all things into completion. So we bless you. Lord, awaken tangible connections in these 
abstract thoughts that they had begun as until they're no longer abstract but they're absolutely fact, truth, connectivity, union, oneness, delight, joy, and peace and righteousness. Do it for us, but do it for your glory. Make it known. Help us in prayer as we pray these things forward. May they begin to be revealed by your spirit in the midst of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Bless you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a good evening. We'll get into more of this next week. Pray if you can. Join us on 6.30 tomorrow night.